Food safety is an important part of public health. If the food we eat is not handled properly, it can make us very sick or in some cases kill us. This program will help you understand your role in keeping food safe and how to reduce the chances of making food that will get people sick. In Riverside County, it is required that anyone who works in public food service must get a food worker's certificate. The information presented here is designed to help you with the exam and with your job as a food worker by giving you basic food safety knowledge. We'll also give you an idea of what things the health inspector will be looking for when they do an inspection. Food protection should be important to everyone, but as a food worker, you are also responsible for keeping food safe for the public every time you go to work. Food also includes some things that you might not have thought about, like drinks and ice. Mishandling of these can make people very sick. Our bodies need food to stay healthy and strong. Sometimes the food we eat can make us very sick if it is not made safely. When someone gets sick from something they eat or drink, we call it a foodborne illness. Having a foodborne illness can feel a lot like the flu. Someone who has a foodborne illness would probably complain of upset stomach, vomiting, diarrhea, fever, and chills. Each time a person goes out to eat, they're trusting that the food being served will not make them sick. You, the food worker, play a very important role in making sure that people do not get sick from the food and drinks served by you. So why does only some food make people sick? What makes it bad? Sometimes food can become unsafe when it has something in it or on it that is not normally a part of it. This is called contamination. There are different types of contamination. Let's look at them. Physical contamination. This happens when something you can see and feel gets into a food item. Some examples of this would be hair, glass, metal fragments, fake fingernails, or even flies. Chemical contamination. This can occur when a chemical like a cleaner, bug spray, or medication gets into a food item. An example of this could be storing bleach or floor cleaner on the shelf above the food preparation table. One accidental bump and the bottle could spill on the food. If a person eats food that has been chemically contaminated, they could be poisoned. Pathogenic contamination. This is the kind of contamination that is the most dangerous because it is impossible to see. These tiny germs, called pathogens, can end up on food and become thousands of germs. Some germs are more dangerous than others. Pathogens are germs that cause disease and include bacteria, viruses, fungi, and protozoa. It's hard to tell if food is contaminated with these types of germs. The food will look, smell, and taste normal, maybe even great. People will usually think that the food is okay and eat it, germs and all. Each of these types of contamination could cause a foodborne illness, but the most common cause by far is bacteria. Babies, small children, pregnant women, very old people, and those who are already sick are more likely to get a foodborne illness because their immune systems are not as strong. Bacteria are everywhere and on everything. Pathogenic bacteria, the bad bacteria, can be found naturally in most types of food. They can also live on the surfaces around the kitchen and even on you. You might not even realize it since the germs are not visible. If you don't protect the food, those germs will end up in someone's meal. Bacteria can be transferred to foods where they are not normally found. This is called cross-contamination. Cross-contamination happens when the bacteria from one type of food comes in direct contact with another type of food. A good example of this is using one cutting board for different types of food without washing it between uses. Raw chicken is known for carrying lots of harmful bacteria. If raw chicken is placed on a cutting board, these bacteria will get all over the surface. If the same cutting board is used to cut vegetables, the bacteria will then be transferred to the vegetables. The vegetables are now contaminated with bacteria. Another way that food can become cross-contaminated is by food workers themselves. In fact, anything and anyone that comes in contact with food has the potential to contaminate that food. Most bacteria found in food can be killed by cooking, but cooking doesn't always make food safe. Some bacteria produce a poison or toxin that can also cause foodborne illness. These toxins are not affected by the heat of cooking. That's why you have to work hard to prevent bacteria and other contaminants from getting into the food in the first place. 
We are all sources of bacteria, and there are many ways that food handlers can contaminate food. Good personal hygiene practices like daily bathing and constant hand washing are extremely important. Bacteria can be spread when food workers forget these rules and handle food the wrong way. Here is a list of things you can do to make sure that the food you are handling stays safe. Wash your hands. A lot. Don't wear jewelry. Keep fingernails short. Cover open cuts and wounds. Keep your clothes clean. Keep your hair restrained. If you are sick, don't work around food. One of the most important things you can do to prevent foodborne illness is wash your hands. Science has shown that when food workers frequently wash their hands with soap and warm water, most of the germs are removed and don't make it into the food. Remember, whatever your hands touch will end up on the food unless you wash them. Always wash your hands after using the restroom, touching your face or hair, sneezing or coughing, smoking, using chemicals or cleaners, and taking out the garbage. And before and after eating and working with raw meats, poultry, or fish. Before you wash your hands, find the sink that is for hand washing. Do not use food preparation sinks or dishwashing sinks to wash your hands. The hand wash sink should always have liquid soap and single use paper towels or a hot air blower. It should never be blocked and needs to be easy to get to at all times. Did you know there's a right way to wash hands? Following these six steps can help make sure that you are doing your part in keeping bacteria out of food. First, Turn on the warm water to a minimum of 100 degrees Fahrenheit and wet your hands under the running water. Next, put some liquid hand washing soap in your hand. Wash your hands for at least 15 seconds. It might be easy to time this by singing a song like Happy Birthday two times in your head or saying the alphabet slowly. Rub your hands together to make a lather, making sure to get in between all of your fingers and under your fingernails. Also, scrub the backs of your hands and all the way up to your elbows. When you have finished, rinse the soap off with warm, clear water. Dry your hands with a paper towel or hot air blower. Use the paper towel to turn off the water so you don't pick up more germs. Hand sanitizer is a great addition to hand washing but should never be used in place of it. After following the correct hand washing steps, you can use hand sanitizer before going back to food preparation. Wearing gloves when you make food is also a nice addition to hand washing, but is not generally a requirement. Keep in mind that wearing gloves does not mean that you don't have to wash your hands. Hands should be washed before putting on a fresh pair of gloves and after gloves are taken off. Also, gloves should be changed as often as hands would normally be washed. Disposable gloves may not be reused. When you are making food, you should not wear jewelry that could get in the way or spread bacteria. The state law says that if you wear anything more than just a plain wedding band, you must wear gloves when you are working with food. The reason for this is that jewelry has lots of small spaces where bacteria can hide. Food can become cross-contaminated if the bacteria from the jewelry touch the food. The same is true for fingernails. Nails should be kept clean, neatly trimmed, and filed. Food workers with long or fake fingernails must also wear gloves. Nail polish can chip off and fall into the food, so food workers should not wear polish unless they also wear gloves. Every human being carries bacteria in their body. This means you can be a source of contamination if you are not careful. If you have any cuts, open sores, or rashes on your hands or forearms, you must cover them with bandages and wear gloves when working with food. If not, the bacteria, blood, or pus from your body can get into the food. You must wear clean clothes when working with food. Food that is spilled, splashed, or wiped onto clothing will let bacteria multiply. This bacteria could then get onto hands, equipment, or food. Wear an apron to cover your clothes and change it whenever it gets dirty. Also, don't wipe your hands on your apron or clothing. Remember, hand washing is the most important thing you can do. Long hair should be pulled back or worn inside a hat or hairnet so it doesn't fall into food. If you are sick, you can get everyone around you sick. This includes those whose food you are making. 
It is very important to stop handling food or utensils if you think you are sick. Food workers that are coughing, sneezing, or have a runny nose that doesn't stop should stay home or be moved to a job duty that does not involve food or utensils. For really bad illnesses, especially those that can be passed along through food, the food worker cannot come to work unless they are no longer sick. As we've discussed, some bacteria can be found naturally in food and others can get into food through bad food handling practices. Our bodies can usually fight off small numbers of bacteria. Bacteria become dangerous when they are given the chance to multiply. It takes time for bacteria to multiply. In the right conditions, the number of bacteria can double as quickly as every 20 minutes. So if you start off with one germ, in 20 minutes it will split and you will have two. Another 20 minutes, the two will become four, then four will become eight, and so on. At that rate, there will be more than a billion germs after 10 hours. Some bacteria can get someone sick with just a few bacteria, especially if the person has a weak immune system. In this picture, you can see that if bacteria are allowed to keep splitting, it doesn't take long for food to become very dangerous. So how do we keep these bacteria from multiplying? In order to keep growing, bacteria need several things. Food, moisture, time, and a temperature that allows growth. If we can control at least one of these factors, we can stop the bacteria from multiplying and keep the food safe. Typically, many of the foods we eat are very moist and a perfect place for bacteria to grow. These foods are usually called perishable and can go bad if they are left out at room temperature. Another name for them is potentially hazardous foods, or PHF for short. Most bacteria can multiply quickly while living in or on potentially hazardous foods. Some examples of potentially hazardous foods are dairy products, eggs, meat, seafood, and even foods that have already been cooked. We have to handle potentially hazardous foods very carefully in order to limit the growth of bacteria. The best way to keep bacteria from growing in potentially hazardous foods is to keep them at the right temperature. There are two ways that you can do this. You can either keep potentially hazardous foods cold at 41 degrees Fahrenheit or colder, or hot at 135 degrees Fahrenheit or hotter. The temperature range between 41 and 135 degrees is called the temperature danger zone because these are the temperatures where bacteria grow best. Sounds easy enough, right? Either keep the food cold or hot. So what can you, the food worker, do to make sure that potentially hazardous foods stay safe and out of the temperature danger zone? Well, you can't tell by looking at food if it's hot or cold enough, and feeling it with our hands is not a good option either. Thermometers are the only way to know for sure if the food is at a safe temperature. The place where you work should have thermometers on hand to check temperatures. There should be a thermometer in every refrigerator to make sure that the food inside is at 41 degrees Fahrenheit or colder. Keep in mind that refrigerator doors are opened and closed many times throughout the day. Each time the door is opened, some of the cold air comes out. In order to make sure that the food inside stays at 41 degrees or colder, the refrigerator should be set at a lower temperature, like 38 or 39 degrees Fahrenheit. It is also important to have clean probe thermometers so that you can check the temperature inside of both hot and cold food. The temperature inside of the food is most important and will be one of the main things the health inspector checks during their inspection. By cooking food to the right temperatures, most bacteria and other germs will be destroyed. This means that all parts of the food, even the inside, must reach a minimum of 145 to 165 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on the type of food. You can use a probe thermometer to make sure that you have cooked food long enough. Stick the thermometer into the thickest part of the food to make sure that it is cooked all the way through. Remember to clean and sanitize the thermometer between uses. Here are the minimum cooking temperatures and times. 145 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 seconds for raw shell eggs broken for a single customer order and served right away. Fish and single pieces of meat such as beef, veal, lamb, pork, or game animal. 155 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 seconds for hamburger or other meat that is chopped or ground. Raw shell eggs that are not served immediately for a single customer order or any other foods containing raw eggs. 
ratites, which are the bird's emu or ostrich, and injected meats that are injected with solutions for flavor or tenderness. 165 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 seconds for poultry like chicken or turkey. Comminuted poultry that is chopped or ground. Stuffed foods like fish, meat, poultry, ratites, or pasta. And stuffing that contains fish, meat, poultry, or ratites. Food that has already been cooked and cooled can be reheated and then served again. You must make sure that the food reaches 165 degrees Fahrenheit when it is reheated. Only after food has been cooked or reheated can it be placed in a steam table or other equipment for hot holding at 135 degrees Fahrenheit or above. Remember, the food must already be at 165 degrees Fahrenheit before it is put into the hot holding unit. You may want to save food that you have cooked so you can serve it again later. This is okay, but the food will need to be cooled to 41 degrees Fahrenheit quickly. This can be hard if you have a lot of food to cool. For example, if you have a large pot of hot refried beans and you put it into the walk-in cooler, the beans close to the sides of the pot will get cold quickly, but the beans in the center will stay in the temperature danger zone, sometimes for days. Food that stays out of temperature for a long time will grow dangerous levels of bacteria. This is why cooked food must be cooled quickly. You can take as long as six hours to cool hot foods down to 41 degrees Fahrenheit as long as they are cooled to 70 degrees Fahrenheit within the first two hours. There are several ways that you can do this. Large amounts of food can be split up into smaller, shallow containers. When cooling, food should never be more than four inches deep. Always use metal pans instead of plastic. Metal pans will help transfer the heat better so the food will cool down faster. You can also cool small containers of food by placing them in an ice water bath. When using an ice water bath, make sure that the container is pushed down into the ice water bath to the level of the food. If you don't, only the bottom portion of the food will get cold, allowing germs to grow on the other parts of the food. It will also help if you stir the food while it is in the ice water bath so it cools down faster. Another way to help food cool down faster is using chill paddles. Chill paddles are hollow plastic paddles that you can fill with water and then freeze. Once frozen, you can stir the food with the paddle and it will help cool the food from the inside out. And finally, some facilities use special equipment that cools foods quickly, like a chill blaster. No matter which method you choose, use a probe thermometer to make sure the temperature is dropping in the right amount of time. It is always a good idea to keep written records of how much time it takes the food to get to the proper temperature. Did you know that there are only four ways to thaw food to keep it out of the temperature danger zone? You can thaw food while you are cooking it. An example of this is soup or stew. When you put frozen vegetables into the soup pot, they will thaw while the soup is being cooked. The best way to thaw food is in the refrigerator. This will take some planning because it will take a lot of time for the food to completely thaw. The good thing about using a refrigerator is that the temperature will never get above 41 degrees Fahrenheit as long as the refrigerator is working. Another way to thaw food is in a clean preparation sink. The sink should be filled with cool water so the food is surrounded. The faucet should be turned on so that the cool water is running over the frozen food. The cool water will thaw the food and flush away particles but won't allow it to reach dangerous temperatures. The last way you can thaw food is in the microwave. This is a very fast way to thaw food. If you choose to use the microwave to thaw frozen food, keep in mind that the food needs to be used as soon as it is done defrosting. Do you know the difference between cleaning and sanitizing? Cleaning is the same as washing and rinsing. Washing and rinsing gets rid of the leftover food and grease. Sanitizing kills the germs. Items need to be washed, rinsed, and sanitized after every use and sometimes more often. Utensils that are used for serving or cutting all day should be cleaned at least every four hours. In order to wash the dishes by hand, you need a three compartment sink, which is one large sink area with three sinks in it. Three compartments are needed so that you can wash, then rinse, and also sanitize the dishes and utensils. 
There are four steps to make sure that the dishes, silverware, cooking utensils, and other food contact services are safe to use. The four steps should be done in this order because if done incorrectly, germs might survive and people could get sick. Step one is dishwashing. Dishwashing is a very important part of food safety. After you scrape all of the food and trash off of the dish, wash it in hot 100 degree Fahrenheit water. This will take place in the first compartment of the three compartment sink. You can use regular dish soap and some sort of tool that will help you scrub the dish like a brush or a cloth. Step two is to rinse with warm water in the second compartment to remove all soap and bubbles from the dish. After the dish is rinsed, it should be placed in the third compartment for step three. Step three is sanitization. The third compartment should be filled with water and one of the approved sanitizers, either chlorine bleach, quaternary ammonia, or iodine. The dish should be placed under the sanitizer water for 30 to 60 seconds, depending on what type of sanitizer you are using. If you're using 100 parts per million concentration of chlorine bleach, you will need to soak the dishes for 30 seconds. For 200 parts per million concentration of quaternary ammonia, the dishes should soak for 60 seconds. If you're using 25 parts per million concentration of iodine, the dishes should soak for 60 seconds. If you sanitize using hot water at 171 degrees Fahrenheit, the dishes should soak for 30 seconds. Step four is air drying. After the dishes have been washed, rinsed, and sanitized, they should be air dried and then put away. Do not use a dish towel to dry them or you might recontaminate the dishes. No matter which method you use to sanitize the dishes, you will need to use testing strips to show that the dishes are getting sanitized. There are special testing strips to use with the different kinds of sanitizers. When they are dipped into the sanitizer solution, the strip will change color depending on how much sanitizer is in the water. The testing strips for chlorine sanitizer start out white and change to a bluish purple. You can compare the color to the key on the side of the container. This will tell you how much sanitizer you have in the water. The chart below shows that chlorine sanitizer should measure 100 parts per million, or ppm. That means for every million parts of water, you would add 100 parts of chlorine. This is about one capful of bleach for every gallon of water. At 100 parts per million, chlorine sanitizer will kill bacteria. If the reading on the strip is lower than 100 ppm, then you will need to add more sanitizer. If it is higher than 100 ppm, then you should add more water. Keep testing the water until you get the right mix of water and sanitizer. The strips for quaternary ammonia and iodine sanitizers can be used the same way. Follow the chart to make sure you have the right amount every time you set up the sanitizer solution. Some places have machines that will automatically wash, rinse, and sanitize the dishes. Dish machines are pretty easy to use, but they still need attention. Some dish machines use chemical sanitizers, similar to those we talked about for hand washing dishes. Other dish machines use very hot water to sanitize dishes. These high temperature dish machines should have some type of built-in thermometer to measure the temperature of the water. When it reaches the plate, the water should measure 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Dish machines need to be checked every day to make sure they are working. It is best to check the machine in the morning before any dishes are run through it. That way, if there's a problem, you can fix it before the machine is used. For high temperature dish machines, you will need to test that the water is reaching at least 160 degrees Fahrenheit in order to sanitize the dishes. This temperature can be measured with disposable heat strips that look like stickers but change color when they get hot. Dishes and silverware aren't the only things that need to be cleaned. Floors, walls, ceilings, equipment, and shelving all need to be kept clean and in good repair. If it is used daily, it should be cleaned daily. Some things even need to be cleaned every four hours. Make sure that you are cleaning in those hard to reach areas underneath, behind, and above shelving and equipment. Don't forget the restrooms and trash areas. Bacteria can live there too. It's a good idea to keep a schedule of cleaning so that nothing is left out.
There are some things that are too large to fit in the sink or in the dish machine. These items must be taken apart and cleaned where they are. For instance, the mixer is too large to fit in the dishwashing sink, but it breaks down into smaller pieces that will fit. The process will follow all of the same steps that we talked about earlier. First, it should be washed in place with soap and hot water. Take a bucket of soap and water and a cloth right over to the area where that large piece of equipment sits. Then the equipment should be rinsed in place by using a clean, wet cloth to remove the soap. Sanitizing in place is a snap. Just fill a spray bottle with a mixture of sanitizer and water, test it with a test strip to make sure it's the right amount, and then spray the sanitizer on the surface of the piece of equipment. Don't forget to let it air dry so the sanitizer can do its job. As a food worker, you will probably use wiping cloths from time to time. These cloths are used to wipe down counters, tables, or food prep surfaces. Using wiping cloths is fine as long as they are used for one purpose only and stored correctly to prevent bacteria from growing. After a cloth has been used, it should be stored in the sanitizer solution. If not, each cloth should be tossed into the laundry hamper right after it is used. No matter if the sanitizer is used to hold wiping cloths or to sanitize dishes, it needs to be changed out from time to time. The sanitizer will get used up and there will be nothing left to kill the bacteria. Test it often. If the testing strip shows that the sanitizer level is too low, it should be drained and replaced with a fresh mixture. If there's not enough sanitizer in the bucket, you're left with a bunch of dirty water with lots of germs to spread around. Food protection is a very important job. As a food worker, it's your duty to protect the food from the moment it comes in the door until it's served to the customer. When food is delivered, you should look at it carefully to make sure it's not damaged, contaminated, or tampered with. Cold foods should be delivered in a refrigerated truck or packed in ice. If you do not feel that the food that has been delivered is safe, you should not accept the order. Never accept dented cans, damaged packaging, or potentially hazardous foods that are in the temperature danger zone. Once the order has been accepted, it should be put away as quickly as possible. You should always store food inside the building and in an area where it will be safe. This means that food should be stored in areas that are only for food storage. Never store food in the same place as cleaners, chemicals, or personal items. In a refrigerator, the way the potentially hazardous foods are stored is very important to food safety. Raw meats and shell eggs should always be kept on the bottom shelf below other types of food. Produce and foods that are ready to eat should be stored on the very top shelf. If not, the juices and drippings from the raw meats might fall onto the vegetables and then, yes, you guessed it, cross-contamination. The raw meats and eggs should also be kept separate from each other. You wouldn't want the juices from the chicken to get on the beef or an egg to break and fall onto a raw hamburger patty. Cross-contamination is dangerous, so be careful where you place things in the refrigerator. Food containers should be covered and labeled. They should also be stored at least six inches off the floor. This will make it easier to clean the floor and allow more airflow. Sometimes people forget that ice is also a food. Even though it is cold, there are some germs that can grow in ice. Ice should be stored in an area where it is protected from contamination. Ice that is going to be used in drinks should not be used to keep other food items cold. Also, you should never use your hands or a glass to scoop ice. Only use a clean ice scoop. When food is prepared, there are many ways that it can become contaminated. You, the food worker, can take the following steps to keep food safe. Wash your hands often. We've said it before and we can't say it enough. Hand washing is very important to food safety. Never smoke, eat, or drink in food preparation areas. Use the employee break areas for these activities. Prepare raw food separately from ready-to-eat food. Cutting lettuce on the same cutting board where raw chicken was just sliced is a surefire way to spread bacteria. If possible, use separate cutting boards and knives for different types of food. If not, just remember to clean and sanitize the cutting boards and knives between raw and ready-to-eat foods. Use the preparation sink when preparing food. Mop sinks, dish sinks, and hand washing sinks are dirty and can pass bacteria or chemicals to the food. 
Make sure to clean the prep sink before each use. Put chemicals and cleaners in an area away from food and utensils. An accidental spill could cause a chemical contamination. Also make sure that all of the cleaners have labels that can be read easily. If the cleaner is put into a spray bottle, make sure that the name of the cleaner is written on the outside of the spray bottle. Never use containers that once held food to hold toxic chemicals and don't use toxic containers to hold food. The light bulbs in the areas where food is made should be shatterproof or have some sort of protective shield around them. That way, if the bulbs break, the tiny pieces of glass will not fall into the food. When you are making food, follow good hygiene practices. You need to be careful that things like fingernails and hair don't make it into the food. When you serve food, try to use a utensil, like a spatula or spoon. When you pick up plates, glasses, or silverware, make sure that you don't touch the part that will touch the customer's mouth. Leftover food should never be served to other customers. If the food has been served once, it should not be served again. Even if the customer didn't touch their food, it has to be thrown away. Only unopened, packaged foods like crackers and condiments can be restocked. All food made for the public must come from an approved source. An approved source is a place where the food is made that has been inspected by the government. Food for the public cannot be made in a private home because private homes are not inspected or regulated in any way. Basically, there's no way to tell if the food is safe. Make sure that all food deliveries come from an approved source. Always keep the invoices and receipts in case the inspector needs to see where the food came from. Sometimes people like their food not fully cooked, and some food items are not meant to be completely cooked, like raw sushi and hollandaise sauce that is made with raw eggs. It is okay to make the food the way the customer wants it as long as they know that it is not fully cooked. If the customer orders the food undercooked, it is safe to say that they know what they are getting. But if the food they order is made with raw or undercooked ingredients, then they need to be told either directly or in writing on the menu. Rodents and insects can spread bacteria and contaminate food. These pests are very difficult to get rid of. The best thing you can do is keep them out in the first place. Keeping doors and windows closed or screened will stop the pests from getting inside. Flying pests, like houseflies, can be kept out by putting air curtains above the doors. Air curtains are machines that blow air downward at a high speed. Air curtains should turn on automatically whenever the door is open. All doors should automatically close completely. A good rule of thumb is to look for light coming in the cracks around the door. If light is making its way inside, chances are the pests are too. Rodents and cockroaches can flatten themselves and squeeze through very small openings. So how do you know if you have pests? Look for the common signs. Rodents will leave gray or black rub marks along the walls or shelves. They also leave droppings that can be seen easily. Cockroaches leave droppings that look a lot like pepper. Both rodents and cockroaches usually hide during the daytime, so you might not see them. If you do see them during the day, there's a good chance that you have a really bad pest problem. If any of these pests have found their way inside the facility, there are some things you can do to get rid of them. Don't leave food out, and make sure that all packages and containers are sealed tightly. Clean up the kitchen before you leave so that there are no food scraps for the pests to munch on. Fix any leaking plumbing and make sure that drains are not clogged. Like us, pests cannot survive without water. Keep things clean and organized. Piles of junk and unused equipment make a perfect place for pests to sleep and breed. Fill all holes in the floors, walls, or ceilings. Cockroaches live in very small places. Even a tile that's starting to come away from the wall could be a perfect roach bed. Flies like to breed in garbage, so make sure that the trash bags are tied tightly and that the lids of the dumpster are kept closed. The dumpster should be emptied at least twice a week. Keep the area around the dumpster clean and tidy. Don't pile trash bags or boxes on the ground, and make sure that the grease bin is clean and covered at all times. If you've tried all of these suggestions and pests are still a problem, you may have to use some form of pest control. There are lots of different traps and pesticides out there, but be careful because only a few can be used around food. Many of the bug sprays that you find in stores are not allowed around food. Check the label. It should say that the product is approved for use in a food facility. 
you can also hire a professional pest control company to help get rid of the pests. There are many different companies that you can use as long as they use products that are safe when used around food. You will see a lot of different signs posted in places that make or serve food, but there are five that are required by law. A sign should be posted next to each hand washing sink to remind food workers to wash their hands before returning to work. There should also be a sign posted in the dining area that tells the customers if there is no restroom available for them to use. A no smoking sign should also be posted in the dining area. At each health inspection, the facility will be graded on food safety and illness prevention. The inspector will post a letter grade of A, B, or C in a place that can be easily seen by the customers. This grade card may not be moved, damaged, or covered up. Only an employee of the Environmental Health Department can take the card down once it has been posted. And the final sign is a public notice telling customers and other members of the public that they can ask to see a copy of the last Environmental Health Inspection Report at any time. It is against the law to refuse to show them the report. As a food worker, you have a huge responsibility to keep food safe. Customers are depending on you to protect the food they eat. Here's a recap of the most important things you can do to prevent foodborne illness. Wash your hands often with soap and warm water. Don't handle food if you are sick. Keep potentially hazardous foods at 41 degrees Fahrenheit or below or at 135 degrees Fahrenheit or above. Cook meats, fish, and eggs all the way through. Cool potentially hazardous foods as fast as you can. Wash, rinse, and sanitize food contact surfaces and dishes. Only use food from approved sources. As an employee of a food facility, you are a first-line defender of our nation's food supply. In this day and age, the threat of an attack that is meant to kill or make people sick is very real, and we need to work together to protect ourselves. Since an act of intentional food contamination has the potential to affect a massive number of Americans, it is very important that every food worker does their part in defending the food they are serving to the public. A lax attitude towards food defense can leave a facility open for attack. Facilities where employees are not paying close attention to what's going on around them are most likely to be targeted. To encourage food workers like you to take an active role in food defense, the FDA, CDC and USDA have created the Employees First program. This program was designed as a training tool to teach employees to be more aware of food defense and how to prevent intentional contamination of the food they prepare and serve. Remember FIRST and what it stands for. You can make a difference in your facility and help keep this country's food safe. Employees are the first line of defense. Follow company food defense plan and procedures. Inspect your work area and surroundings. Recognize anything out of the ordinary. Secure all ingredients, supplies, and finished product. Tell management if you notice anything unusual or suspicious. For more information on Employees First or any other questions regarding this food worker program, contact your local environmental health office by calling 1-888-722-4234 or visit our website at www.rivcoeh.org. Glossary of Terms Approved Source where food that is sold or given away to the public is made. Approved sources are regulated by the government and inspected for food safety. Bacteria. Germs that are found in and on food that can make you very sick. Contamination. When something dangerous gets into food. Cross-contamination. When germs are transferred from a food or surface to another food. Foodborne illness when someone gets sick from something they ate or drank. Pathogens, bacteria, virus, fungi, and protozoa that can cause disease and sickness. Parts per million, term that is used when measuring the level of the sanitizer, the number of parts of sanitizer that would be added to a million parts of water. Potentially hazardous foods, food that can grow bacteria and must be kept under temperature control. 
ready to eat. Food that will not be cooked, it is served to the customer to eat just the way it is. Sanitized, when the germs have been killed. Anything that comes in contact with food must be cleaned and sanitized before being used. Temperature danger zone. The temperature range between 41 degrees Fahrenheit and 135 degrees Fahrenheit. This is where bacteria will grow the quickest. Potentially hazardous foods should not be held at temperatures within the danger zone. Toxin. Poison produced by pathogens.